All right. So um, Sarah Stanley uh, is our presenter today, and she's a digital humanities librarian at Florida State University, where she consults with faculty and students on digital projects, leads training on digital tools and methods, and builds infrastructure for digital projects. Sarah got her start in digital humanities at the Northeastern University Women Writers Project, where she encoded and edited early modern women's writing. Her main areas of research are in infrastructure for digital editions, modeling text data, and using digital methods in the classroom. She received her Master of Arts in English from Northeastern University and is completing a Master of Science in Information at Florida State University. She previously served on the Text Encoding Initiative Technical Council. Um, all right, Sarah, floor is all yours. Um, uh, hi, everyone, and um, thank you for that wonderful introduction, Ellen. Um, and thank you to you all for being here today. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about some addition projects that the Florida State University Libraries has been engaged in over the past few years. Um, specifically, I'm going to be talking about some tools we've developed for building editions that compare multiple versions of texts, whether those be drafts or variant editions or translations. Um, so I'm going to start off um, today with a little bit of history and terminology of editing variant texts, and then I'm going to move on to an overview of the key technologies used to edit and store what I call comparative editions. And basically all this is, is just any edition um, that you want to use to compare multiple texts. Then I'm going to provide a specific overview of the comparative edition solution pack um, and the first project that we used that solution pack for, which is the Burroughs project, um, which is a project led by Dr. Stan Gondarski in the Department of English at FSU. Um, and then I'm going to show some future directions that the libraries are headed um, as we create more editions that are meant to show multiple variants and versions of texts. Um, so to start off today, um, I wanna talk about the critical apparatus, which for the purposes of this talk is going to be the most specific way of modeling and presenting textual variation. Um, and from this starting point, we're going to expand out to other ways of modeling variant texts. The critical apparatus in the context of print editions is a way of representing textual variation, um, especially in contexts where there are significant differences between multiple possible readings. In uh, the chapter, Apparatus Text Interface, How to Read a Printed Critical Edition from the Cambridge Companion to Textual Scholarship, Paul Eggert describes the fundamental motivations that an editor has for creating a crit critical apparatus in an edition. Um, he says, these mainly bibliographical problems turn on relationships um, of the variant forms of the text to one another. The analysis of the history of the text transmission over time from version to version in document to document, printing to printing is called textual criticism as opposed to literary criticism. Um, it leads to a defense of the editor's decision about how to treat editorially the textual and documentary forms that have been surveyed. What principles might justify the editor in establishing um, a single reading of the work from among its variant forms, and then skipping a bit. Um, alternatively, if the editor believes that the work ought to be understood as being constituted by its history of textual variation, then the goal of establishing a single text to present the work makes far less sense. More emphasis will fall on the so-called apparatus that records the work's textual history over time. The editor's study of that history will have revealed its own peculiar problems to which both kinds of editions must respond um, in some coherent way. Um, uh, now for today, we're going to be a little less concerned about the peculiar problems revealed by the history of the text. That's kind of more to the textual scholars and editors. Um, and we're going to be more um, concerned with the problems presented by the inter interface that we use to present the text itself. Um, um, and so to demonstrate this, I'm going to use an example from Shakespeare's Hamlet. Um, as many of you might know, the three earliest printed versions of Hamlet vary widely from one another. Um, we refer to these three versions as Q1, Q2, and F. And the Qs stand for quarto, which is a type of format, and the F stands for folio, which is another type of format. So there are two quartos and one folio. Um, Hamlet poses a challenge to editors. Uh, Q2 and F are slightly too long to actually be used in performance, so they likely were not the performed version of the text. But Q1, the shortest, the most likely um, in terms of length to actually be performed, is basically unrecognizable as Ham Hamlet. Everything's in the wrong order. Um, a lot of the speeches that we recognize today are completely changed. Um, and there have been a lot of attempts to represent this varied printing history throughout the years in an edition. 
Um, and, and this slide shows you an example of one of them that actually uses the critical apparatus. Um, this particular version is from the Arden Hamlet, um, uh, which provides two different versions of Hamlet, one from 1603 and another from 1623. And for those of you who study Shakespeare in the audience, you know that 1623 is the first folio edition. Um, and so here we see a line, specifically a stage direction from Hamlet, indicating which characters should be on stage for that particular scene. Um, now, if this seems a little bit like a knockoff Hamlet with Rosencraft and Gilderstone instead of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, that's because the particular base text used in the Arden version that I'm referring to um, is from that less commonly used first printed edition that we call Q1. Um, the bit up here in the middle is what we would call the lemma, and that's basically the base version of the text. And the critical apparatus itself is down at the bottom where we have the variant readings from other versions of the text. Here we see that Q2 and F have different readings for Ophelia, which indicates that Ophelia should be spelled with a PH like in the modern version instead of the F. Um, but we also see that the folio version has Rosencrantz and Guildenstern that are actually a lot closer to the modern forms that we recognize today instead of Ross and Kraft and Gil Gilderstone. Um, additionally, we can see that there is an addition of and other lords to the end of the stage direction indicating that there should be more um, people on stage. Now, of course, this is an out of context example, um, which is going to make the reading more confusing regardless. Um, but even with the additional context <laughs> that I'm providing, um, it's, rather, it's a rather confusing um, bit of textual information to parse as a reader. Um, we, know about the, we need to know about the his, uh, printing history of Hamlet. Um, we need to know about Q1, Q2, and F. Um, presumably this information would be provided in some kind of um, uh, editor's preface, um, but in order to understand it without context, we need to know that uh, printing history. Um, but we also need to do some work to parse the brackets and parentheses um, to understand what's even happening in this passage. And on top of this, you have a single base text that is in the overall flow of the text in between the speeches and the other stage directions. Um, and all of the information on textual variation is relegated to the bottom. And this isn't just the case in my slide. This is also how it is in the printed version of the Arden Hamlet. You have to go through not only um, the slide itself, that space in between to see the difference, but you also have to go through the rest of the scene with the speeches um, and also with some um, editor's commentary and footnotes that are just on the literary and historical context before you get to that critical apparatus. So there's a lot of space in between the base text and its variant forms. Um, this all leads to a very confusing reading experience if you're actually trying to parse out which version um, or witness of the text says what. Um, so um, the particular problem of printed text is something that it can actually be solved um, at least somewhat in a digital space. And that's what I'm going to demonstrate soon. Um, but first I'd like to provide an overview of some of the vocabulary that I'm gonna be using throughout this presentation and some of the vocabulary that I've already kind of slipped in. I don't want to um, be throwing words that are not necessarily recognizable to you, especially if you don't have a background in textual criticism. Um, but the first term, um, which I've already used a fair bit, is critical ac apparatus, which we've, again, already covered. Um, but this is the system of annotation that basically um, indicates variant readings in the text um, and how they relate to each other. Um, the next is lemma, which I've also mentioned a number of times. Um, but this is the base text that is used for um, uh, linear reading. And um, uh, it, it's what in the printed edition occurs in the flow of the text. Um, and so it's that, that base reading. Um, and so in the context of the printed edition, again, this occurs in reading order um, as opposed to being relegated to the side. Um, the next term is reading, um, which is one I think that we all think we recognize, but in the context of the critical apparatus, it is essentially just a version of the text um, that is being presented. So if you have multiple different um, textual objects, each of which has a different, says a different thing, each of those different things is going to be referred to as a reading. Um, and then finally, the last word that I'm going to be tossing about a lot today is witness, um, which is again, a thing that we think we recognize colloquially, but it means a very specific thing in the critical apparatus. Um, but basically this is the version of the text um, that provides a given reading. Um, so we could think of different drafts of a text as being different witnesses. Um, and oftentimes you'll hear the phrase um, draft X is a witness to reading Y. And basically what that says is that this particular witness provides the reading that is being given in the text itself. Um, 
Okay, so now that we have that vocabulary in our heads, we're going to move on to how we can actually model this data so that we can um, display, uh, analyze, and otherwise kind of do, do computers at it. Um, so in order to understand how we actually model this bibliographic data, I need to talk a little bit about the text encoding initiative, which for those of you who know me, it's my favorite topic to talk about. Um, but I'll give you a little bit of background um, on the text encoding initiative, which I'll just be referring to mostly from here on out as the TEI. Um, so the TEI is an XML based format for describing and storing textual data. Um, and so what it does is, is it allows us to provide enriched transcriptions, um, encoded transcriptions of a text along with its metadata so that you can see the text um, as well as its context all stored in the same file. Um, and what the TEI does for us in terms of doing this kind of comparative work is that it provides actually a specific vocabulary and syntax for um, computationally modeling the critical apparatus. So instead of modeling it on paper with um, you know, brackets and parentheses and different characters, um, we can uh, model it computationally. Um, but it also provides some more generic methods for indicating relationships between different bits of text. Um, for example, linking between different sentences that should be compared. Um, and we're gonna be talking about that a little bit later in the presentation. Um, so the way that we actually encode the critical apparatus in the TEI um, is that the variants are encoded as XML data rather than represented visually. So instead of um, using things like brackets or subsetting off to the side or the bottom of the text, we're actually encoding it as XML as data. Um, and so all of the variants are going to be recorded in one app element, um, which as you might guess, stands for apparatus. Um, and then all of the individual readings are recorded with the RDG or reading element. Um, optionally, you can also provide a lemma, so that base, um, but it's not required in the TEI. So what this functionally does is it allows you to kind of flatten out all the readings to not privilege one over the other. All of the readings can just be readings, um, or if you care about a base text, you can also provide a lemma and say, actually, this one's the base. Um, but you can see that in this example here, which uses the Wife of Bath, prologue, um, probably the most uh, recognizable one, I think this is from Ellesmere, um, experience though non octorite. Um, and then we have a few different variants on that. And what this allows us to do um, is record all of these um, just as one apparatus and not really prioritize one reading over the other. Um, so if we were to go back to our example from Hamlet, um, as we see here, instead of recording this with everything down at the bottom um, and one reading our one witness, the quarto one witness being prioritized over the rest of them. We could record this um, using TEI in this way. We have a little bit of metadata up here that provides our three witnesses, quarto one, quarto two, and first folio. Then we assign these identifiers of Q1, Q2, and F that then get used down in the apparatus itself. Um, so what we have here is the beginning of the stage direction, um, which is already what we recognized from the previous slide, but enter King, Queen, Carambus, and um, then we have, well, there's no and, but we have this apparatus here, which provides us with this first reading of Ophelia with an F that is um, witnessed by Quarto one. Then we have a second reading of Ophelia with a PH, which is witnessed by um, the folio and the second quarto. Um, and then we have another example down here of an apparatus that has the Q1 um, witness, which is Rosencraft and Gilderstone. Then we have the um, witness provided by, or the reading provided by Folio, which is Rosencrantz, Gildenstern, and other lords. So again, what this does is basically just flattens out those different readings in an apparatus so that we can interchange them. And you can even envision this kind of being reformatted in HTML and um, basically, you could provide a user with a kind of choose your own adventure um, type of interface where you could toggle back and forth between different readings and kind of create a mix and match version of the text so that you're almost building your own critical edition in the browser. Um, that, that's kind of the goal of event, not the goal, but um, one of the possible goals of um, creating a critical apparatus in this interface is that you could then um, present this information digitally in a more flat way so that you're not prioritizing one reading or one witness over the other. Um, but there are some problems with this method. For example, um, what if the text vary widely in terms of their reading order? So for example, in Hamlet, um, the to be or not to be speech, in addition to being very, very different in content, which you could represent using the critical apparatus, is actually very, very different in placement. It occurs a lot earlier in Q1 than it does in Q2 or F. Um, so 
while it's good at representing that kind of phrase level variance, it's not good at allowing you to mix and match reading order. You would need to use some other method to actually represent all of the texts being kind of mixed up with each other. Um, but then also it doesn't really do a lot of work for things like draft manuscripts in which you might have multiple readings in a given witness. So you can think of someone who's drafting a sentence and rewriting it over and over and over again with slightly different wording. Um, the critical apparatus isn't necessarily good at disambiguating between those different readings that are repeated over and over again within a given witness. Um, and then, so regardless though, transcribing reading order from one given text still implies a kind of base reading. So again, it comes back to that first point. If you're um, working with a text where things are rearranged, like scenes are switched or paragraphs are switched, you're gonna kind of need to pick one base text to use as the basis for your transcription. Um, so if you wanna be a little bit more agnostic about which one is the base reading, it's actually kind of hard to do just with the critical apparatus method. Um, so there are alternate methods for doing comparison in the TEI. Um, and the main one that I'm gonna be talking about today is using identifiers and linking. Um, so what you can do is assign identifiers to different fragments of the TEI, such as phrases or sentences, and then link them between each other. And I have a sort of poor example here, um, but going back to the Wife of Bath prologue, we have this experience though non auctorite, which you can see in the previous version, I'm not going to go back to it, but it um, uh, has each version of the sentence from the different manuscripts encoded in that app. But if you were to create three different files for witness one, witness two, and witness three, you could theoretically assign this an identifier and then say what it corresponds to in different files. So L1 corresponds to line one in witness 2.xml and witness 3.xml. And then in witness 2.xml, that's what this represents. Um, L1 corresponds to the same L1 in witness one and witness two. So ultimately you're doing the same thing where you're comparing experience though non auctorite to experiment though non auctorite. Um, so it's just a different way of formatting the text, but the thing is you need to have each text encoded in a separate file. Um, there are some benefits though to using linking, even though you know having a separate file for each version of the text does um, uh, lead to much more work. <laughs> um, but when you do use this linking method, you can not only do intertextual linking, um, but also intratextual linking. So again, um, linking to multiple versions of the same sentence that occur in one witness. Um, so this accounts for texts where there might be, you know, draft versions of a sentence repeated over and over again. Um, but it also allows editors to edit each version of the text, text, each witness individually as its own standalone text. So attending to the editorial concerns of that one text without needing to concern um, yourself with how that text interrelates with the other ones in that kind of witness ecosystem. Um, so you can treat them each like separate editorial um, concepts. And so this can be useful for things like um, drafts or papers, scrap papers, maybe from an author um, where you kind of want to treat you know, each notebook as its own separate document um, and um, everything's out of order. And that's actually what we're gonna be um, looking at um, a little bit later today, um, actually right now. <laughs> um, so um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the comparative edition solution pack, um, which is something that we uh, developed somewhat recently in the libraries um, to basically do this linking version um, of uh, textual comparison. Um, so just to provide a little bit of history on the CESP, as I will call it, um, uh, the Comparative Edition Solution Pack um, was developed um, because of the Burroughs Project. And the Burroughs Project was created um, by Paul Arduin as a part of his dissertation project for the University of Antwerp. He actually is a dual PhD. He has a PhD from the University of Antwerp and Florida State University. Um, but when he decided he was done with this project, um, uh, Dr. Stanley Gontarski in the Department of English decided to take it over as the sponsor. Um, and basically what the project does is it compares draft editions of Burroughs' Blade Runner, a movie, um, different draft versions that we actually hold in FSU Special Collections and Archives. So we have two different draft versions, three, sorry, three different draft versions. Um, and there are a few others um, held at libraries uh, throughout America. Um, but if you're wondering, oh, is this Blade Runner like the sci-fi uh, cyberpunk dystopia? It is actually not. Um, uh, Ridley Scott actually got the name 
uh, for Blade Runner from this Blade Runner, but they are totally unrelated texts. Um, it would be cool if we did something with the do androids dream of electric sheep version, but it's a different text overall. Um, but the Burroughs project was originally hosted by the University of Antwerp because it was a part of a dissertation project um, at that inst institution. Um, but when they decided they no longer could um, manage the project or keep maintaining the site, um, Dr. Gintarski asked us to um, take on the project. And at that point we had to make a decision about what platform we wanted to use for the project itself. Did we want to keep maintaining the various plugins and um, infrastructure for the existing site when we ported it over or did we want to migrate? And um, because of the kind of outdatedness of a lot of the plugins, um, uh, we did ultimately end up deciding to migrate and we decided to migrate to Islandora. Um, and for those of you who are affiliated in any way with um, Falsi, um, you probably know what Islandora is. It's how we do most of our digital library and repository um, stuff for the state of Florida, but it has a Fedora backend and a Drupal front end. Um, if you don't know what those things are, I wouldn't worry too much about it. But again, it's um, for us consortially managed through um, Falsi, the Florida Academic uh, Library Services Cooperative. And it's actually the um, basis for Diginal, which is FSU's digital repository, which houses both the institutional repository for scholars works, um, but then also our digital library for digitized things from our manuscripts, um, or, or sorry, from our special collections. Um, and so we decided to move to Islandora in part because there was so much expertise in house um, for doing Islandora development. And um, at this point, I would like to do a big, big shout out to Brian Brown, who I believe is in the audience today, um, who is our main Islandora developer, um, main repository developer. He, every time I use the word we in terms of developing the backend infrastructure for this, especially, I mean Brian. Um, Brian basically uh, built the comparative edition solution pack. I just did some of the data and editing work. <laughs> um, so a uh, big, big thank you to Brian um, for all, all of his work on this platform. Um, but so once we decided to move to Islandora, we had to figure out how to actually do data modeling for the comparative edition solution pack. Um, and so the way we decided to model the data was with that linking method where each um, witness was going to be stored in a separate TEI file and then we would link them after the fact. Um, the phrases that were going to be compared needed to each be assigned an identifier so that we could take those identifiers and then compare all the sentences with the same identifying number um, to each other. We could just create lists of sentences. Um, and then, um, yeah, it, it also accounted for things like when there are multiple sentences in a given witness um, and things like that. So we would just take all of the sentences across all of the witnesses and compare them to each other. Um, in addition to doing that kind of draft comparison work, um, there are also is information um, about deletions, additions, and substitutions. Um, so every time someone scribbled something out or overtyped something or amended something, um, that is recorded in the TEI file um, for the individual witness. And then also the metadata for each individual witness is stored again in the same file as the transcription. Um, that is one of the big features of TEI, one of the big reasons that it's so important, but it again allows you to put the text in context and again make those explicit links um, between the um, different witnesses. Um, in the text. Um, so this is kind of what the TEI looks like. It is a tiny little snippet, um, but it, if you think that this is messy, you are probably right. Um, it's a very um, jumbled mess of information, but I will try to parse some of it for you. Um, basically what we have S is for sentence. We have this three digit number, which is our sentence identifier. Um, we have point zero, which essentially means there are no other um, versions of that sentence within that witness. Um, but down here we have 839, which is a different sentence identifier, but we have 0.1, which indicates that it's the first in multiple versions within um, that uh, witness. So in addition to the sentence numbering convention, we also have some fun things like subst, which stands in TEI for substitution. Um, we can see that the typist was the one who did the substitution. We can see what was deleted, which was an S, presumably a typo, and it was replaced with an A. So they basically just you know, used the typewriter to um, type an A over an S. Um, and so that's generally what it looks like. Um, a very small snippet in a very large TEI file. Um, 
But from here, we took these source TEI files and um, created multiple different outputs um, for the different um, functions that we needed um, the solution pack to perform. So for example, we needed HTML display. So we would take the source TEI file and for every single page, um, we would create an HTML display so that a re reader could um, read it more easily. Uh, as you can imagine, we don't want our readers actually reading <laughs> this, although we do let them read it, um, as you'll see. Uh, but um, uh, we, we don't want them to have to actually read that. So we create an HTML display that renders everything for them so they can read the transcriptions a little bit more easily. We also have X, uh, XML metadata for each individual page that was created from the source TEI. And then we also have a sentence index, which just takes all of those different sentence numbers. Um, so for example, 839, and then followed by the sentence itself. So these little sentence index can then be sucked up into the comparative edition solution pack and then compared against each other. Um, so we used XSLT style sheets to transform each witness into a whole bunch of different pages. Um, those are on GitHub. I can send them to you if you're interested in reading XSLT or using them for your own projects. Um, but uh, uh, basically, we just use XSLT to transform the single source into a bunch of different outputs that then allow us um, to create different functions for the solution pack. Um, this is another kind of view of the architecture of the solution pack. So each um, object is a text. There are multiple witnesses for each text. Um, and then for each page of a given witness, there's a TEI fragment, an HTML fragment, a mods fragment, and some sentence indexes. Um, there are also image files for each facsimile and things like that. Um, but yeah, I didn't wanna subject you to seeing multiple pages. You just have to imagine that there's one of these for each page of the document. Um, uh, and so that, that's generally how everything's laid out. Um, now I'm going to attempt to demo this live. Um, if that fails, I do have screenshots of everything, um, but I would rather have you all see it live so you can see, see what it looks like. Um, but uh, let's go back so you can see it from the top. Um, but um, here we have that text view, the kind of top level. Um, if we click into it, we can get some additional information on the text itself, um, you know, a little kind of abstract here about um, the project and the text itself. Then we have these three different witnesses. There can, all the examples I've used, I think have had three witnesses. You can have as many or as few as two um, witnesses as you want. Uh, it just happened to work out that we only have three. Um, but we have this manuscript version that's owned by FSU. We have a TypeScript version and then a revised TypeScript, which is gonna probably be the closest to um, the um, uh, printed edition that we have. So if we click in here, um, we're going to see a page view once we scroll down. And this is kind of what I was talking about with the fragments and the drafts that might be written on scrap paper. You can kind of see um, these are all written at different times. Some of them are typewritten, some of them are handwritten. Um, so it's not really meant to be read as a cogent whole. So it was kind of important to us that we represent this ordering of the text because that's how it, it exists in the folder. Um, it's not necessarily meant to be read in a specific order like that, um, but we can see drafts. So I'm gonna click into page A. Um, and if you've ever used Islandora before, you're like, oh, this looks like what I expect. But um, one great thing that Brian developed is this comparison view. Um, so we can actually not only see the image, um, but we can also compare it to the transcript, or we could compare it to the XML if you really want to read it that way. Um, but we can see here that the transcript has been rendered. Um, we can see those superscripts that are written in um, uh, ink, and those are represented in blue. We can see the rotated text over here. Um, and we also can see that each individual sentence is kind of functioning like a hyperlink. Every time I hover over it, it's um, underlining, uh, which indicates click B. <laughs> so that's what I'm going to do now. Um, but once we click on it, we can see that there are four different versions of this sentence that um, occur across all of the text. Two of them come from this TypeScript, and one of them comes from the revised TypeScript. And so you can also see, again, that these are hyperlinks as well. And so um, we can see a little bit about how these sentences change. This is um, maybe a fragment of the sentence. It doesn't look like it was quite finished. Um, this is one that's just kind of a, a um, variant on this one. 
And this is, again, probably closest to what the final printed edition says. So we're going to click on this one from the TypeScript. And when we do that, it's going to take us to um, the TypeScript and show us, um, it's not going to highlight it or anything, but we, we can see that the sentence again is, is right here. And we can do the same thing, click on it again, it'll bring up the sentence comparison and we could go to the revised TypeScript. And we'll just look at that because again, you can kind of see how clean that is compared to the two TypeScript versions. Um, but we see here that this is a lot um, cleaner and neater than um, the other ones. Um, and then once we get up here, um, you know, you see this display again, it allows you to toggle back and forth between the different views. But if we go over to this analysis tab, it actually um, uses Colatex, which is a tool that collates sentences um, to kind of show the um, differences between the different drafts. Um, it's not a perfect tool, but we can see here that all the readings share agreement on both. Um, but there is difference between these readings because one of them doesn't say teams then it has all three of these. I, I would argue that should be green because they really are all the same. Um, but you can see um, how the different readings diverge and you can see the sentences diagrammed out like this. Um, and so it does this for all of the different sentences in the solution pack. And that's just um, using uh, Colatex, which is an outside service. Um, and so that, that is the gist of the solution pack. So once you get all the data together, you can create um, these kind of more exploratory editions that allow you to read in a linear fashion, right? Just read through one given set of manuscripts, or you can kind of read it in that hypertextual way where you're toggling back and forth between multiple different editions and comparing between the two. Um, and so I'm thrilled to say that I can skip over all of my screenshots and go um, straight into this benefits and drawbacks slide. I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, some of the good things about working with a comparative edition solution pack for us and some of the, the things that you might want to consider even if you do have Islandora, um, whether or not to kind of use this. Um, but the benefits for us as an institution is that it, uh, the comparative edition solution pack leverages our existing repository infrastructure. We were already using Islandora. Um, so it was great for us to just, I mean, it, uh, it was difficult for us to develop the solution pack, but now that it's been developed, if you have Islandora, you can, you know, just, just use the solution pack yourself. It's great. Um, the other thing that's been really beneficial about it is that um, using um, TEI as a base for this project allows us to um, encode the semantics of the text while still creating a display text. If you were to try, like you could probably easily do something or somewhat easily do something like this just with HTML and um, you know some other um, technologies of your choice. Um, but if you were to just use something like HTML, you don't have that bibliographic data underneath it um, that can then be used for analysis. We already have all the data now and we can use it for other projects um, or the English department could use it for other projects and it's all, um, uh, you know, imbued with its semantics and um, data rich information. Um, and then the other thing too is that the multiple file um, system allows um, for multiple versions to be uh, recorded in reading order. So um, again, you could read each individual manuscript as its own separate entity without using the comparative features at all, um, or you could leverage that um, comparison view and toggle back and forth. It's really up to the user. Um, but of course, some drawbacks to this is that, uh, you know, you do need Islandora and you need to have an existing instance of Islandora. Um, so if you don't have that, I would not necessarily recommend using this. Um, it is, I would say, not worth it to spin up Islandora um, just to use the comparative edition solution pack. It's very hard to maintain. Um, the other drawback is that the TEI encoding that we used is non-standard and it's not a part of the existing recommendations. You, if you want to create a project like this one, um, there aren't as many... Um, resources out there for you to use to actually build something correctly. I've written up some documentation on how to um, encode the um, transcriptions and the metadata, um, but that's not exhaustive and there isn't a lot of support and troubleshooting for this particular um, encoding system. Um, the other thing too is that anytime you're going to be using multiple files, it's going to create confusion and it's going to require more maintenance. So those are just kind of some things to consider about um, the comparative edition solution pack. Um, and so from here, though, I, I am interested in exploring um, different ways we could take this kind of comparative reading um, view. So um, one thing in the coming months to year um, that I really want to do 
is move away from the linked model that we've kind of established with the Burroughs project and with the comparative edition solution pack and um, move to something that looks a little bit more like a critical apparatus. I am only one digital humanities librarian and I would like to work with like a single file um, for all of um, my different variant readings. Um, so, uh, you know, because while using multiple files um, ensures that like, you know, one reading isn't prioritized over the other, um, it, it, it is still the problem that you need to maintain um, multiple things. So. Um, I am looking forward to returning to something like a critical apparatus model um, for some of the texts that we're, we're working on. Um, and with that, I do want to show you um, kind of my lodestar in the coming months as I'm um, looking to kind of expand into doing critical apparatus encoding and building these comparative editions. Um, and that is Hugh Kalis's um, uh, app crit demo of Propertius 1.15. Um, and if we look at this, this is um, what looks like just kind of a normal digital edition. Um, we can hover over and see, oh, okay, that looks like a critical apparatus. Um, we see the different readings um, and the different Greek characters indicate um, uh, which witnesses they come from. And if we scroll down to the bottom, we see a very classic um, critical apparatus that's down as a footnote. Um, but if we click on these little ellipses, we can actually see not only does it highlight that, but we can click on the different readings and change it in the base text. So theoretically what we could do is create a kind of choose your own adventure edition, um, a mix and match where you're basically acting as an editor, as a user. And so that's something that I'm hoping to kind of develop in um, the coming months, something like that, um, but for FSU libraries. Um, and just to kind of um, show you where we've gotten. Um, we haven't really tackled the critical apparatus problem yet, um, but we have been working on just some generic um, digital editions displays that when faculty come to us and say, I'd like to build a digital edition, um, we have some tools out of the box that we can um, provide to them. And so the first one um, that I'm the, actually the only one, sorry, that I'm going to talk about is um, Jekyll Hyde, um, which is a static site publisher for digital editions. Um, and so the reason it's called Jekyll Hyde is because it uses the um, static site generator Jekyll. Um, and then we used an egregious backronym, <laughs> which is uh, uh, humanities interface interface for digital editions, um, but we just want to do the Jekyll and Hyde um, thing there. Probably doesn't quite work, but it's a great backronym, so um, I'm sticking by it. Um, and so the display for Jekyll Hyde um, uses Citation, which is also developed by Hugh Kalis. Um, that one is another egregious backronym, and the CETEI stands for Custom Elements for TEI. And basically, Custom Elements is just JavaScript that allows you to um, create extensions to HTML, so custom elements. Um, so basically, what it does is it allows you to render um, TEI without ever needing to use something like XSLT to create HTML. Um, and the Great things about uh, thing about citation is that it can be customized um, so that you can display different elements and different names. For example, the critical apparatus, you could um, customize display for the lemmas and the readings um, to do that kind of toggle back and forth type of reading. Um, and so uh, citation is what we use to display the text themselves, um, but it just builds a single static page. Um, and so Jekyll Hyde basically provides the indexing for all of the different things. So you can take a whole bunch of TEI files and build a website with it instead of just an individual web page. Um, so we have, you know, it, it's creating indexing and table of contents pages. And I should note, um, she will be thanked at the end, but the um, my, my intern last year did a big push um, on a lot of Jekyll Hyde. Her name is Suzanne Raybuck and she is brilliant. Um, she sadly is no longer with the office um, and has moved on to bigger and better things, but um, she did a, a lot of the work on Jekyll Hyde's infrastructure. Um, and so some of the benefits of this, um, of Jekyll Hyde are that static sites are far, far easier um, to spin up and maintain than Islandora. Um, all you really need is a GitHub account. Um, and uh, both Citation and um, Jekyll Hyde are pretty easily customizable um, with minimal knowledge of the technologies that they run on. So for example, JavaScript, um, Jekyll and Liquid are kind of the three big ones. Um, but then the other thing too is that the lightweight infrastructure of Jekyll Hyde is going to be really beneficial as we decide kind of how we want to um, build out these comparative editions because it's lightweight enough that we could theoretically customize something for both the critical apparatus model of um, building these comparative editions, or we could use that linking method that I showed you in the Burroughs arch archive. So it's um, flexible enough that we really could 
um, try to customize for both. Um, and I just wanna show you an example of a Jekyll Hyde project right now. Um, it does not use um, any critical apparatus or any comparative stuff. It's just a translation project that has the original in the translation. Um, but this is a project by Matt Mawitty in the um, Department of Modern Languages at FSU. Um, but basically what he has done is provided us with a bunch of original texts and then translations um, that we've been publishing on this um, Natsume Soseki Poems website that we built. Um, and so um, you can imagine though a future version of this text that maybe um, invites translations from other scholars and allows you to kind of toggle back and forth between these different translations. Um, and uh, you know, see different ways of possibly reading the text. And so that's kind of where we're looking to go um, next with this. Um, and so um, in the immediate future, what we wanna do is extend um, Jekyll Hyde to create critical apparatus or um, linked um, comparison displays. Um, so we want linking between those different um, witnesses. Um, I'm also working to document Jekyll Hyde. There's already some initial documentation so you could test it out and try it if you want. Um, it's on our GitHub um, in FSU DRS. Um, and so, uh, but I, I want to document it further to show the different customization possibilities um, that you, you could, um, you know, how you could possibly extend it for your own project um, and not just use what's out of the box. Um, but then another area where I want to um, extend things is actually to do an image viewer. That is one of the big things that it doesn't have right now um, and where it, it falls short um, in one of the many ways in which it falls short of the comparative edition solution pack. Um, so we wanna be able to um, allow people to include facsimiles if they so choose. Um, and on that note, um, I just want to extend big, big, big thank yous to um, Brian Brown and Suzanne Raybuck who um, did a lot, most of the work on the technical infrastructure for the projects that I've shown you today. Um, and also I want to extend a big thank you to everyone who attended today and um, open up the floor for any questions you might have for me.